so thank you very much, Sharpus. I uh, really appreciate you including Moat um, in this event. Um, as, uh, as said, I, my name is James Almeyer. I, I lead a couple of offices for Moat, uh, both here in San Francisco and in Australia for our APAC sales team. And um, I don't know how people, but many, how many of you know what Moat actually does. So before I even get into this content, I think it maybe just makes sense to take uh, 10 seconds and talk about what Moat does. Uh, Moat is a third party and objective measurement company, which basically means we don't buy media, we don't sell media, we don't serve media. We act as an analytics provider for publishers, we act as an analytics provider for platforms, and we act as an analytics provider for brands to help all of those parties better measure the success of their digital and mobile ads. That's, that's, that's our business. Um, and when we think about measurement of ads, we think of it uh, through the lens of attention. So that's what we're gonna be talking a little bit about today, is how brands view mobile advertising and digital advertising as a whole, um, and how we help them uh, measure that, measure those ads through the lens of attention. Um, Moat uh, very recently, or just this year was, um, or 2017, was acquired by Oracle, and we're part of the Oracle Data Cloud. Uh, Oracle Data Cloud is the most ubiquitous third-party data provider for brands to target audiences online. Um, and we fit into that in some pretty interesting ways. So the reason why I wanted to start here, it's kind of a, a very Oracle slide here for sure, um, but just to kind of introduce the idea of what brands think about advertising. When you think about a brand, what their goal is with, um, with their ads is really first and foremost to make sure that that ad shows up um, on a screen, right? And has the opportunity to be seen. Um, on top of that, they wanna make sure that it was actually seen by a human. Pretty basic, right? But that is kind of the minimum line of how a brand thinks of an ad uh, existing. Um, on top of that, they, they then look at, was that, brand, was that ad that was seen by a human served into a appropriate envir environment, right? And that's con kind of considered brand safety. And we'll get into some examples of all of these things. And then once the, the, those minimums are hit, um, big brands would say, okay, now that I know that that minimum has been hit, did anybody pay attention to that ad? Right? Did anybody see that ad enough where they would consider acting on that ad? Um, and then once you have that idea of uh, this, this ad that has now been paid attention to, brands think about who was it that was paying attention to that ad? Right? Was this my target audiences? Was this an 18 to 24 year old? Was this um, you know, the, the right group? Do I wanna find more of this type of people? Are they more likely to buy or less likely to buy my products? And then after all that said and done, they wanna tie those individual impressions and their individual ad campaigns to business outcomes. And that's what Oracle Data Cloud together with Moat are trying to piece together across the entire digital, when I say digital, I mean digital and mobile uh, ecosystem for, for brands. And giving publishers and platforms the tool to demonstrate how effective they are in delivering this value to brands, okay? Um, so let's dig in a little bit here. Um, when I talk about attention, uh, Attention is, is an interesting concept, and uh, most very recently Microsoft even did a study out there, and the CEO of Microsoft said that uh, the true scarce commodity is increasingly human attention. Uh, so really, um, it's just getting harder and harder to keep people's attention, is what it comes down to. Um, and we see that it's pretty evident. Their, their study actually showed that the human attention span has actually decreased by about 40% over the last 15 years. Um, and that's significant in a lot of ways if you think about that. Um, I think it's pretty clear how, what, what that correlates to. That correlates pretty much to the, the rise of, of mobile, right? The rise of, of smartphones. Um, obviously a lot has happened in the last uh, uh, 10 years and now we went from the original iPhone to, to some really, really cool devices out there that you can do tons of fun stuff with and play tons of great games. Um, and there's just a ton of these devices out there. So as human attention is decreasing, the rise of uh, smartphone sales is increasing. And in fact, I think the numbers from 2017, at least from this data source, was 1.53 billion devices uh, sold globally. Um, and it's interesting, with, with the rise of, of smartphones um, and people spending more and more time on their phones uh, to consume media, right? Media being TV, media being games, media being whatever it may be, any type of content, there's actually been a tremendous decrease in where people are spending, uh, where they're consuming media across all the other mediums. So the only one that's had an increase is the internet, and the internet includes digital, is, includes mobile. Um, 
In fact, 75% of all internet use in 2017 was mobile-related internet use, um, which I think is a, a really interesting stat. Um, this is all stuff that, that you probably know that mobile phones are here to stay for a while, for sure. Um, <laughs> but what's interesting as well is that when you look at that, that where people are spending their time, what happens is that's where brands go as well. And for the first time in 2017, when the numbers are finally calculated, they, they expect that digital advertising will actually be more than TV advertising for the very first time. Um, and that's a, that's a big thing in the industry, for sure. Um, and I think it's just very um, clear that these trends are not just you know, predictions anymore. These, these things are happening, right? Um, and in fact, when you think about it, as the, as the advertising now is moving into this mobile world and this digital world, um, actually, I have one more slide on the trends. We're actually seeing that time spent on mobile is also on the rise, uh, and in particularly in non-voice uh, related activities. Um, and then the other component of it, which I think is really relevant to Chartboost as well, is around um, videos, right? People are, are really engaging in videos online. And I, we think about video as both a watching a TV show, but engaging in an, in an ad unit, which can, which can deliver uh, a good narrative if it's delivered within a, a video format, right? That can be a mini piece of content if it's delivered properly. Uh, and we're just seeing more and more time spent with mobile video. Um, and again, where the, where the eyeballs are going is where the advertising is going. Um, but the problem is, is once the, once the advertising is going there and where brands come in, brands have certain expectations when it comes to advertising. So for one, from a brand's perspective, they think, they think TV works great. They get to disrupt content. They get to deliver a fantastic creative to a captive audience. It's very standardized of either 15 seconds or 30 seconds. There's all these standard metrics about how to measure it and all that type of stuff. And they expect the same thing in digital. And they expect the same thing in mobile. And those, those, those expectations might, are, are not quite in line with the experiences that are out there. Um, and that's something that, that, that Moat tries to help brands understand and tries to help publish, to educate publishers and developers and platforms so they can go educate brands on the differences as well. And the fact of the matter is, brands have to realize this, right? Uh, people don't watch TV the way they once did. They, they're just spending more time on different devices and consuming media how and when and, and where they want to. And from a brand's perspective, this is really hard. This, this picture encapsulates it a lot because now, if you think about a brand, what they're trying to do is tell their story, right? And in the TV, they get to tell it consistently, you know, every Thursday night at 9 o'clock, but now they have to figure out how to tell their story on all these different devices, right? And target all these different people individually um, and understand who is, who is watching that media, consuming that media at that time. And that's a big challenge for brands overall. Um, so as these dollars shift there towards the mobile and towards digital, there are some foundational problems that need to be solved in order for brands to be really comfortable in spending more money in digital and mobile. Um, one of those problems is viewability, which was, which was mentioned earlier on. And um, it's a pretty basic idea of viewability. Um, it's kind of like the idea of, hey, if an ad is not seen on a device, it's like a billboard facing the wrong direction on a highway. Right? It really doesn't have any value. Right? From a brand's perspective, I paying to be in front of somebody and my ad was never in front of somebody doesn't have any value. Um, and this, is a, this concept has now been around for about five years um, and it's an interesting concept. It's not a moat concept, this is an industry concept. Um, and if you think about where it comes from, it really comes from outdoor advertising where if you were to buy a billboard in Times Square, at the very least you'd expect it to be able to be seen. Right? So it's taking that just very generic idea and applying it to the digital and mobile world. Um, and that's what a viewable ad looks like on a web page, right? Everybody can see that, right? Makes sense? You can see it, it's on the screen. Um, but coming up with a definition around that was actually a little bit trickier and took all the different parties in the industry to, to, to kind of come together and come up with a definition. And this is the definition they came up with. They basically, for a display ad, 50% of the pixels need to be on the page or on the screen for a continuous one second. And for a, video ad, uh, for a video ad, it's 50% of the pixels need to be on the screen for a continuous two seconds. It's a pretty small, it's pretty uh, low minimum, a low bar. And mobile is actually the same. Those, those standards are the same for desktop and mobile. Um, we like to think about this in a couple of different ways. So while there's this industry standard out there, there are tons of brands that spend tons of money online 
that have, they say, okay, that's great that that industry one exists, but we spend millions and millions of dollars online. We want to have our own definition of what a minimum threshold should be. And in this case, this is, a, this is actually Group M, I don't know if that's relevant, but it's a, the, largest, the largest media spender in the world is a, is a group of agencies referred to as Group M. And these are their definitions of what a minimum uh, threshold for an ad impression should be. The, the display one is just about the same. Um, it just means that 100% of the pixels need to be on the screen without really a time minimum. The one that I want to focus on is the video impression. Um, video CPMs are, are really are, are quite high. And Group M spends a lot on that. And they said, we want to make sure we're getting more than just two seconds of our story told. So we want to know that 100% of the pixels are on the screen with 50%, uh, for 50% of the runtime, and we want the sound on. Right? That's very different than the industry definition. The reason why I bring that up is because that's a stricter definition overall. And if you look at the results, um, if you look at the difference here, this is just desktop video. I'll show you mobile in app, mobile in app in a second. But if you look at the results, uh, the industry benchmark is over 60% or just barely over 60%, meaning still 40% of all ads online, video ads online, are not even meeting that minimum threshold. But if you put a stricter definition on it, only a one third of video ads are playing on the screen fully for, with the sound on for half the duration of the ad, which I think is pretty telling. Uh, and why brands may have some hesitancy to spend a ton of money online because they're just not getting what they expect. Um, and interesting with in-app, uh, you see that um, for, for, display, for display units, it's about the same as desktop. But when you look at, uh, when you look at uh, sorry, the, so I'm in, uh, what am I in here now? Mobile in-app display, um, it's about 50%. And then mobile, mobile in-app display with the agency definition where it's 100% of the pixels with no time, there's actually a pretty big difference. And if you think about mobile behavior, that actually makes sense. Because if somebody, an ad was served, they may be swiping off of it very quickly, right, in someone's device, which would, which would be a kind of a lower uh, one that has a time minimum. But for a metric that doesn't have a time threshold, then that would be higher because that was there, the whole thing was there, even if they swiped off it quickly. I uh, hope that made sense. Um, and if you look at uh, mobile in-app, um, a lot of times I've, I've, I've spent a lot of time talking to apps over the last four years. And many times and, uh, apps will, will, will say that 100% you know, of our ads are in view. Just absolutely. The fact of the matter is when you look at apps in aggregate, it's still only about 50% of apps, uh, video ads served in app environments are meeting that minimum definition of being in view for two seconds. Um, obviously, there are differences in platforms. A platform like Chartboost that offers a great uh, experience, and, and um, then you have much higher numbers. But when you look at app overall, uh, you'll see that the numbers are still about 50%. Um, and why is this important? Well, it, it works. Viewability works. It makes sense. If I buy 100 ads and only 10 of them were ever seen by somebody, uh, I can expect a certain result. The idea would be if I can get 90 of those ads to be seen, I should have significantly better results. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and I think what brands are coming to realize is that if, there, if the ad was not seen, if there is no view, then there is no value. Um, and we still have to address the fact that five years later, 40% of ads are never on the screen at all. Uh, which brings us to the second part, which is about ad fraud. Um, this, one's a big, this one's a big deal, and it's a, ad fraud is a big problem, and it's not and it's not, uh, it's not just desktop. It's definitely happening in app as well. Um, and it's something that has really been a plague on the advertising business overall. Um, it's about, a, they, they say about $7.2 billion, and we expect it to be higher in 2017. So it is a big problem. And what I want to just focus on in, with the, on this slide, I didn't go too deep into, into fraud here today. But I think what I would say from a, from a developer's perspective is um, all big brands are using a service like Moat. They just are. That's the way it is. They're using a third-party measurement provider to help them understand how effective are my brands. And what they're doing is they're looking at results, right? And they're looking at their results on individual apps, even within platforms. And if they see fraud, or they see it, what we would call invalid traffic, high levels of invalid traffic, even just once or twice, what happens is they just quickly optimize away from that app and they really don't come back to it, right? So it's just something that, you know, from a developer perspective that should be definitely paid attention to. You don't get a second chance, 
right? Brands won't come back and say, oh, let's give this, let's give this game another chance, even though they, there was this high level of fraud. And now fraud happens, you know, a lot of times the publisher themselves is a victim of fraud. But it means it, you have to stay on top of it. You have to make sense. You have to be sure that you're paying attention to it and, and avoiding it uh, because it can have a lot of impact on, on your uh, ad revenues, for sure. Um, so the, the, the idea here, as I just said, is that everybody's using measurement. Um, and the reason why is because even big publishers like Facebook have had a lot of problems measuring their own ad inventory. Um, and uh, Google itself has had trouble measuring their own inventory. And, and at this point, 97%, I don't know who the 3% are, but 97% of all brands believe that they should use a third party like Moat to measure their, to measure their ads. Um, the other component of this that we need to think about, though, um, is, is view, uh, beyond viewability and uh, whether it was served to a human or not, is you want to make sure those things are maximized, but not at the expense of user experience. Um, so if just like sites and apps could flood their, could flood their uh, sites uh, with uh, impressions historically, now they could flood their sites with viewable impressions. And I have just the best example I could find is a desktop one, I apologize, um, is you know, this is not the experience that a brands want. But all of these ads are viewable, so publishers can kind of game that system. So you have to be careful that this is also not an experience that brands want. So when they look online and they're going deep into their optimization strategies, they're ensuring that, that the user experience, the context that their ads are served in, um, are not just meeting the metrics, but they're also providing good experiences to consumers where they want to associate their brand with. Um, and the fact of the matter is, ad blockers are on the rise. Um, if, you're, if you're sacrificing user experience uh, when you're a publisher of sorts, um, they will, they, it's, gonna, it's gonna increase the, the prevalence of ad blockers, and we're seeing large numbers. Um, and particularly with mobile ad blocking, for sure. Um, it's 159 million active users in China and 122 million active ad blockers in India. Um, it's about 19% of desktop users, as an example. Are, are actually blocking ads on their browsers. And that's a direct impact of bad advertising, you know, um, and just sacrificing user experience, um, in my opinion. Um, so let's dig in a little bit about uh, some of the, about video in general, and video ad units, that is, in general. Because it, pr it, it provides some pretty unique challenges. So back to the TV example, um, it's a very consistent experience. Brands know what they're getting, they know what they're buying, whether they buy on NBC, whether they buy on ABC, it's a 15 to 30 second spot that runs all the way through, that the sound is on and all that type of stuff. That's not what it is in digital, right? There are tons of different ad formats out there when it comes to digital. Um, there are tons of different environments, tons of different devices, uh, tons of different types, um, and that's a challenge overall. Um, you know, here's just a, it, it, it just completely varies by the, even, not, you don't have to worry about just app, but each app has a different format. And this is something that brands think about, and what they look for is some consistent way that they can measure those ads across all those different platforms. Um, and that's kind of what Moat has been trying to help them do, and this is an area where we can dig in a little bit. Here, one of the, one of the metrics that we, that we offer is what we call Moat Video Score. And what Moat Video Score does, it takes the, the components of a TV ad that are most important. So those components being how much of the screen did the ad take up, right? How much of the runtime of the ad was the ad on the screen? Pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, how long was that ad and how much of the runtime was the sound on? Those are the, pretty much the four components of a video ad in general. And we, we, we've built an algorithm that helps you combine those four elements and give you a way to actually compare um, how your ads in, your in, in a given environment compare to TV. And I think this is a, a, a great example of a place where um, Chartboost can offer a ton of value uh, to developers because this is a, a metric that they'll do really, really well in because of the experience that they bring to the table of a, of a great video experience um, within a game. Um, but again, context, context and environment matters. It can't just be all about the metrics. The example that I would use for this, I don't know how loud this is gonna be, so if it's really loud, I apologize. Um, if you look at that ad kind of running, it's actually, let's see if it'll work, that Wonder Woman video ad, right? That ad is running, it's viewable, we're human, it's in a brand safe environment, uh, it's running there. But that's a pretty different experience than what you see here. I get no sound, actually, uh, from, what you, from what you can see here. And even that is a very different experience from what you get here. 
right? And brands are challenged to understand the value they're getting from their CPMs that they're being charged for their video units across these different environments. So they, they try to, they can't just use single metrics, right? And they have to look at things very objectively. And that's kind of what Moat helps them do a little bit. Um, and that's why we think um, when you look at the different levels of attention in those three different examples, we think attention is really what, it, what it's about, right? And what the right, it will become the, the trading currency out there for advertising. Um, and it's also, again, when you talk about context and environment, from a brand's perspective, again, and if I'm a financial services company and I'm advertising on The Economist, again, meeting all the minimum thresholds is one thing. It's a little bit different if I'm, an, if I'm advertising on this site. So I'm meeting the minimum thresholds. I'm a human, I'm brand safe, I'm viewable. But this is, again, not the, the place as a big brand for a financial services company that I want to be advertising. And they look at that. They look at that very carefully. So you always have to kind of keep in mind of who is this advertiser? Is this the right context for them? Am I delivering in a brand suitable environment for them? Um, and the problem with that is that um, brands simply do not want to be against inappropriate content because what happens to them in their mind is that if they're served next to inappropriate content, the person that saw that ad is now going to think less of that brand. And brands have spent millions of dollars building up that brand equity so that people think positively about their brand. Um, it's a lot harder to win someone back. Um, and some really simplistic examples of what that brand safety problem looks like, these were some big stories, is, you know, this is an example of sandals showed up on front of a, you know, in front of an extremist video. Um, that's not the best example. You know, pe that is not what sandals wants when they're advertising. And that's just another thing to think about when you have uh, big brands advertising inside your apps. Um, and it went everywhere. It happened on YouTube. It happened to lots of different places. Um, and you know, people threatened YouTube and said, "We're just simply not going to buy from you anymore if you can't solve this." Right? And that's YouTube, that's you know, one of the top 10 advertising you know, environments out there. Um, that's why context, as I said, context and environment matters to drive quality attention and why attention, um, while it's the right denominator for, for measuring the effectiveness of ads, you have to layer in that context component to it. Um, and that's what we, we're focused on here at Moat. And then I had one little, um, one little thing, so on this, on this idea of attention and ads, I asked my two daughters today, and this is just a little bit of tidbit, tidbit on uh, what's coming in the future, and I asked them, what do you, what do you think about, because they play lots of games online um, on tablets and phones and all that type of stuff, and they're 10 and 8, and I asked them both, just what do you think of mobile advertising? You know, and they said, mobile advertising. I said, you know, the stuff that you see inside the games. And both of them, almost in unison, said, it's annoying. And I said, okay. Can you expand on that a little bit? And they said, well, the one, this is my, my daughter Zoe, the younger one who plays a lot of Plants vs. Zombies, said, well, the ones that you can watch and you get like extra points for, those are okay. And then the other one chimed in and said, but not if they're too long. And sometimes they're really hard to X out of. And that's really annoying. So if you think about that, that is a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old already thinking that user experience is important when it comes to uh, mobile, game, mobile gaming. And that's a really, I, I, didn't, I didn't set it up at all. I just asked them totally out of the blue. Um, and if you don't think that people are going to think about that, they are definitely thinking about that at a very, very young age. And that's it. Thank you so much, yep. James. Thank you. Any questions in the audience? That was great. I actually have one question. Sure. Go so, for it. So um, I see, obviously, well, rewarded video is here to stay. We're also very big believers uh, <laughs> on that. But are there any considerations you could give specifically to game developers that are trying to <laughs> define the placements within their game where they could show these ads? Any considerations um, that would make those placements more attractive to brands um, in terms of which ad formats, and in which position. What you you tapped into some of the high level considerations, but specifically around ad placements, what 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 is your take? On what would make those placements more uh, attractive to brands? Yeah, I think I think from a the brand from a branding perspective, I think the first thing that brands look at um, is the metrics, right? So I think that. Um, that's from like the, the overall, hey, I am Nestle, I am Procter & Gamble. Um, I want to make sure that the ad that I'm buying has a high metric. And if it has a high metric, so anywhere you can put it where it's going to be highly viewable, 
whether that's across the bottom, on the side, or you know, an interstitial that people are engaging with, um, that's the first lens that they take looking at things, right? The next lens they're gonna, they're gonna ensure is that it was a human, obviously, um, and that what is the content associated with that? Is that something that I want my brand to be next to? And once you've hit that, they're gonna wanna spend more with you, right? So then what you have to worry about is really, and this is where it's gonna be very app specific, am, how many ads can I sh serve up or what is the ad experience I can do that simply doesn't sacrifice my user? Because if they move away from your app, move away from your game, then you can't serve any more ads to them. Um, so I don't know if that's the exact answer you're looking for, but I think it's a matter of, from a brand's perspective, it's the metrics, but in order to continue to deliver ads to brands, it has to be about the user experience. And when we think about brands, we put many different categories together, sure. and, and I assume that, I don't know, food brands versus retail and, and clothing think very differently. Can, can you share some insights on do the thresholds vary a lot depending on the, on the verticals of brands, financial, food, or? I think they do. Um, I think, uh, you know, I think there is definitely a different appetite for advanced metrics based on the campaign goals. And I think those campaign goals definitely vary by category and by industry. Um, in a general kind of breakdown of, hey, this is an awareness campaign or a brand campaign where I'm literally trying to associate my brand with something, I think that's where it's looked at very closely. Where it's a, I want to get an install or a download, it's looked at less closely. To specifically on you know, food brands versus retail brands, you know, we work across the board and there are not many brands that want to be associated with bad content. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't happen, right? Um, regardless if they're selling food or they're selling financial services, um, a loss of a connection to a consumer is very costly to them. Um, so I don't know if there's a difference when it comes to awareness campaigns. I think, it's, I think all those things are, are brought into it. And if they're spending big, big dollars on vi video CPM, then they're going to look at it really closely regardless of the industry. Um, you, you should have one um, website that has all these different ads on the page. Like I said, it was one kind of way where the, the website was cheating the system. Are there any other ways that websites were cheating the system? Yeah, I mean, there, there definitely are. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a perfect example of um, this adage out there that is, you know, once a measure becomes a target, it's not no longer a good measure because people can then game the system to maximize that, that metric. Um, so I think there, there's always that balance, but I think the other ways that people are, are mainly gaming the system besides flooding their sites with viewable impressions like that is around fraud. Um, there are things like hidden ads. Uh, there are um, examples of, and I'll use apps as this example, not to call out apps, but just as an example, where even if an app is not being played or, or or, in, or being used, ads are still being served into that app and being counted. Um, those are all things that are, are ways that the system is being gamed. Um, I think the, the worst cases are the, are the fraudulent cases where there are you know, just continually ads being served either to bots or to um, inactive devices. And that's stuff that, you know, as that market matures, right, as, as people that are perpetuating, perpetuating that fraud become more sophisticated, so are the detection technologies to pick up on it. Um, and stuff that you might have, people might have been able to get away with, you know, a few months ago, you don't really get notified that you've been detected. You just, all of a sudden, brands will start moving away from, from those, those environments. So there's a lot of different ways. I think, I think hidden ads and serve, like, ads serving behind another ad is, a, is another good example. I don't know, did that get to your answer? Is that okay? Yeah. James, I actually have one last sure. question. So when you guys started, you started from a, pr primarily on the, on the web, and now you're accompanying brands towards the app. Do you see still uh, kind of skepticism to, from brands to buy an app? And how can we actually, as an industry, educate brands better about the opportunities uh, within the app audience? Yeah, I think there is still some skepticism, but I think it's around, I don't know if it's as, as thinking that apps are any less valuable from a branding perspective. I think it's more of can we measure those environments, right? Um, because 
if they're not taking Facebook's word for it anymore, they're not taking YouTube's word for it anymore, how great of the advertising environments these are, they're not gonna take an apps, a smaller apps word for it that I deliver great ads all the time, right? They want to know um, that they can measure themselves using an objective third party that does, has no skin in the game um, to say, uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good ad. That, that was served to a human in a brand safe environment. There was an opportunity to engage with it. Somebody paid attention to it, and maybe you can even tie it back to some sort of business outcome. So I don't think it's an idea that they're skeptical that it's a lesser environment. I think it's a skeptical that, hey, let us measure there. Um, and it's not that apps are pushing back on that, it's just an industry thing where there are some technical difficulties in allowing, because uh, every app is built differently, in allowing um, measurement in there. And that's what ch one of the things that Chart Boost and, Chart Boost and Mode have been working on, obviously, is to expand uh, the places where measurement can happen inside of app environments so brands can feel more comfortable investing online. Okay. All right. Well, All right. Oh, one, more, one more question? Oh, wait, wait, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit off topic, but um, the 20% um, ad blocking Desktop, right? Desktop. That was desktop, yeah. Um, it's pretty striking. Mm -hmm. How do you see that coming into the mobile world? Like, do you, like uh, until we get to that, we're going to pass it. I mean, I don't. I'm not an ad blocking expert by any means whatsoever. Um, I believe that. Uh, if there is a demand for ad blocking services within apps, somebody is going to build it, and. Uh, the more times that a user is frustrated with the experience that an app is offering, then the more often they're going to be out there searching for an app ad blocker, and the more often they're going to find it. Um, and it, that's why really user experience is, is, is something that we tell our clients about all the time, both on the people that sell the ads and the buy the ads, that you have to take that in consideration, because advertising funds the internet, right? No matter what, advertising funds the internet. It all comes from the brands. All of the money comes from the brands. Um, and if their ads are not being seen, then there's less money, then there's less games, then there's less platforms, then there's less of this entire advertising ecosystem out there. Um, so you can't sacrifice on user experience. Well, thanks. All right, well, thanks. Thanks for coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.